deconstructing the myth, uh, the, um, the feast trial. Um, and it sounds quite a grandiose title, but I'm not going to deconstruct the, the, the evidence or that we generated until you really understand, yes, that's right, the background of, of the trial, um, for which I really do then have to take you back to when we first conceived doing this sort of research. So the train left the station in 1998. Um, I, I was based at the St. Mary's Hospital at that time, and I was just completing my consultant training. So it's very important to actually understand the origins of the feast um, and why was the feast trial necessary? Because I think with publications of a, of a paper that says obviously um, it puts obviously the, the um, Africa on, on the map, but what you don't tend to see is what actually went on behind that. What was, why was the trial necessary and what was the work that actually underpinned that trial? And as I said, it went all the way back to 1998. Um, just um, in 2000, having put a proposal into the uh, Wellcome Trust, I joined the Kemri Wellcome Trust Research Program, which is a, 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 at, the, at the time was a relatively nascent organisation, um, and they uh, were uh, critically looking at um, children with severe malaria, trying to improve the outcome. Because at the time, children coming into hospital with severe malaria, their, their mortality rate was around 20%, and they were trying to actually look at for new targets to try and improve outcome. Because at the time what was only available was quinine, and if you were lucky, a blood transfusion. So they had noticed also that children with severe malaria were acidotic, and this is the research program that I then took forward. But as you see, um, between us starting and the, and the pipeline is still going, it's, it is many, many years of uh, research, over two decades almost. So why is research um, in these environments a priority? We found it really difficult to highlight, although we tried to highlight this, it was important. People would say, well, if we can just prevent children from coming to hospital by giving better community-based care or vaccinations, why would this be important? But about 30% of children in Africa in their final illness will present to a hospital. So actually, what happens in the emergency room is dreadfully important in determining whether a child lives or dies. And many of the deaths occur very, very shortly after admission. So those decisions that you make at that point are also important. We'd noticed that about 15% of children coming into hospital, irrespective of what a condition they came in with, had shock. And um, most of these, uh, and the case fatality for these was 20% or above. So supportive therapies, um, other than just giving antibiotics, etc., hadn't really been thought of as health priorities for these settings. So uh, these are, this is the area that I work. Um, I'm based in Kilifi, um, on the coast of Kenya, um, and I was working in the feast trial um, in East Africa, which took me into Uganda, four sites there, down into Tanzania, and obviously our, our research center in, uh, in Kilifi. Um, I'm just going to take you to one of those hospitals because I think it's important you see the context in which it was done. So this is Sorote Hospital, one of those hospitals in, in Uganda, in eastern Uganda. 8,000 children um, go through this little tiny emergency room each year and onto the paediatric ward. This is just the last hour's admissions um, uh, with many of these children presenting um, as emergencies. Also very important to recognise is that for in virtually all of the settings in, in sub-Saharan Africa, there is no access to intensive care. So that emergency room and a paediatric ward is, is as good as you get. So whatever you do, uh, you can't, there's, no, there's no backup, there's no um, safety net, there's no access to intensive care. So I'm going to take you to Achen Loy here to, to get you to the bedside. Five-year-old Achen Loy has just arrived in hospital with suspected malaria or sepsis a bacterial blood infection. Every year, these illnesses kill more than two million children worldwide. They so Achen Loy had spent many hours coming from her village. She arrived and although the lights were on, she was in deep coma. She, you saw her, she was panting. She was panting because she was severely acidotic. Her base excess was minus 27. So when I heard about this girl and I knew that the, the teen, that um, the parents had given permission to film her, I thought she's not going to survive very many hours. But we're going to come back to Action Loy later on. So this is the context in which we're working. We wanted to try and improve outcome, but we needed to be responsible in terms of actually trying to generate the evidence to get funders to, uh, to um, fund us. So we... In the decade before 
the feast, we got funding for the FEAST trial. We conducted physiological studies looking at myocardial output um, in relation to fluid resuscitation. This is, on, this is also looking at uh, CVP um, responses to, I know people don't like CVPs, but that was all that we could have. Um, this is in a small little high dependency unit in Khalifi. We showed that actually we could safely give boluses of between 20 and 40 mils and, and bring the CVPs, which are sometimes unrecordable or low, into a normal ranges within a few hours. So that, that, ha that, that sort of informed us that we were able to give floats and that we were also seeing the, the, the type of response that you would expect. We also wanted to study, rather than just saying we're just going to go ahead with saline, we wanted to see if whether a colloid would be better. And uh, we did a whole series of phase two trials. And the, uh, this, uh, w what came out as the, the best solution, we, we looked at um, heta starch, we looked at uh, uh, gel effusion, and also albumin. And it seemed that albumin seemed to be, so that's, um, this is a forest plot, and, and if it's on um, this side of the, as you say, it favors um, uh, uh, albumin. So in all of those trials, albumin had a much better outcome than any of the other fluids. But I think that, uh, there's a couple, two points that I want to make. These were small st studies, and obviously sometimes small studies can throw up rogue results. One has to recognize that. But also, none of these studies had a control trial, and we needed to do the control trial to show that uh, f uh, fluid resuscitation was safe and saved lives. We took years to get funding. We had grant after grant after grant going down, and, and, and but we, we persisted but because th there was many contra controversies and co uh, controversies um, and challenges. We found that physicians were saying you can't possibly do this trial in Africa without having a back uh, ICU backup and basically saying you can't do research in this area. Pediatricians were very clear: it's unethical to do a control trial. We know fluid boluses work. But also then we talked to the doctors in the hospital and they were saying, well, we've looked at these international protocols. We're very, very worried. We wouldn't want to do that in our centre. So this was trying to build up equipoise. Um, but um, overall, I mean, so we, were also, uh, we also recognised that very, very few children were receiving fluid res resuscitation. But there was an imminent rollout of a, what's called ETAT, emergency triage and training, that was about to roll out fluids across Africa. And we wanted to do that research bef before it became the, the, the normal practice. The, the chair of our DMC for the feast, that's the external body that was looking at that, he, he often talks about doctors having very, very fixed or um, certainty, but it's unstable certainty about what they think is best and best treatments. And so I, I think that this, this very much reflects how, you know, the equipoise around the question that we're asked. So finally, we were very, very lucky. We got funding from the Medical Research Council in the UK. And I'd also like to thank Baxter firm. They, they didn't, were not involved in the design or running of the trial but they generously donated the fluids because they recognised the importance of the trial. We wanted to make it pragmatic. Uh, a child doesn't come into the emergency room with a label on its head. We wanted to include as many conditions as possible. Obviously, it, it wasn't relevant to severe gastroenteritis because we were looking at albumin. It, that needed rehydration rather than uh, um, uh, fluid resuscitation and also some other conditions which it wouldn't have been relevant to. So this is the context. This is, again, this is Sorote Hospital. We had to um, implement lots of um, different things, but this is a, ch a child in the, in the FEAST trial. I know that this is not what you would normally recognize as in a trial setting, but this is the Sorote Hospital once again. The design was a very simple design. We were giving boluses largely in the first hour, either a bolus of albumin or a bolus of saline, and the vast majority of children received only a single bolus of 20 mils per kilo. Because we were concerned about bolus, 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 and no, and, and no, no um, backup, that they were allowed to repeat that at one hour if the child remained in shock. So um, mo we realized that most children only received one bolus with a few getting extra. Um, the control arm was maintenance fluid only. So they were getting fluids, but they were only getting four mils per kilo per hour. Uh, so. The reason why we did a protocol amendment, we'd had expected, and it was written into the trial, that if the trial steering, the um, external committee monitoring the trial thought the data from the trial or the emerging data, if they thought control was worse than uh, this, the two groups, that uh, they would be dropping that. And they hadn't dropped it after four interim analysis. So we were concerned that we just simply weren't giving enough fluid. So we increased that in the last six months of the trial to an initial bolus of 40 mils per kilo. We had very simple but very robust um, uh, primary endpoint, 
mortality at 48 hours, um, and then secondary endpoints including 28-day survival and, 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 and neurological deficit at that point. So this was one of our emergency rooms before we started, and of course we, we wanted to ensure that children also received all the other aspects of emergency care. So we uh, improved the sort of facility, we um, made sure that there was oxygen concentrators there and all other standard treatments, um, antibiotics, anti-malarials, and uh, ability to, to diagnose and correct hypoglycemia. So they were all implemented for all children across the trial. So everybody got a good standard of care on top of which they were their, random, uh, their randomization. We recognized that training, training, training was really important, and that was not just before the trial, but that was also continued. We, ha we had a full-time trainer throughout the trial and that rotated around the site to make sure that children, A, were fo or they were following the guidelines, that children were being monitored very, very carefully. Um, so we also had to... Um, uh, create other things that we wanted to get the sickest patient into the trial and the only way we could do that was to have an emergency consent process. We've written that up and that was fully supported by the ERCs. We also had 100% source, docu source document monitoring so every bit of paper was looked at by these two people. They were they are trial monitors. So they were very, very strict and to make sure that all the data that was went onto the database was correct. So the date we, we, we were able to enrol to over 3,000 uh, 3, patients in two, year, two calendar years, and that's actually three lines in one. This is what the, the Medical Research Council um, in London, the, the, uh, the clinical trials unit, was seeing, that they were seeing accumulation. They didn't see one curve going the other way, so that means that everybody was following what they were meant to follow, so that's three lines in one. But we had a fifth interim analysis, and I got a phone call that evening, which I simply couldn't understand. Uh, the chairman said, uh, fluid resuscitation can be of no benefit. And that really confused me, because we, we believed that we'd done a good trial. We, we, we were very, very uh, perplexed about that, and they, they recommended that the trial steering committee, which they did the following morning, um, stop the trial. So nobody knew the result apart from a few of us, and I just want to let you know what the doctors thought about uh, the, what they thought the results they of the trial. They to Uganda to be told the result. Until then, only a few of us knew, and we were sworn to secrecy. The scientific paper was now ready for publication. Yes, but we finally realized it was done. Before the presentation, I asked nurses and doctors to try to predict what the result would be. Which treatment was better? So do you think the bolus worked or did it work? We the didn't believe it worked. worked so, so much. Because <laughs> they were dying patients and they were saved. Yes. We had our first patient mm -hmm. who was brought in a moribund state and after the initial bolus, the girl got up and asked for a drink. So by that, it made us feel that fluids are actually very important and it's good that we administer them uh, rapidly. Yeah, going by what I've read and what I've experienced in treating some of the children that give bonuses, I think some of them benefited. Yeah, according to how I've been observing the, the children whom we've been treating, they've actually been coming up after giving the bonuses. Based on observations, kids who received bonuses actually improved quickly. So I think uh, bonuses really help in the immediate outcome. So that's not a selected number of, that's what every single doctor and nurse said, that's a few, and they were all very clear that they were happy with the safety of them, and they all guessed that fluid boluses uh, saved lives. But this is what the DMC saw, they saw over time, uh, the sort of, this means uh, boluses are better, that means boluses harm, this is what they'd seen in the emerging data of harm, and this was the real result of the trial, where we found that, uh, that the combined bolus arm um, a 10% mortality um, f at 48 hours, the primary endpoint, compared to a 7.3%. Uh, seven, uh, so a clear difference, um, a, 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 a better outcome for those not receiving a fluid bolus. Um, and as you can see, the, this is the curve, it's the same data. But I think the important thing is that there's, you couldn't put a cigarette paper really between albumin and saline, even although they've both got fairly difficult, different physiological properties. The fact that they actually had the same, same mortality was also extremely surprising. But the most surprising, obviously, is the no bolus arm.
And this, they didn't just, ch children in the uh, no bolus arm just didn't hang on to 48 hours and then fall, fall away after that. All the way throughout to day 28, then, uh, their survival was better, uh, or um, less mortality um, in the bolus arms versus the control. Um, so, so why did we... Did we feel confident that these children, um, that giving fluid bolus was, was good because we saw them come up a lot quicker? But also doctors were asked every time they went to see them, you've got to check for pulmonary edema, you've got to check for heart failure, you've got to check for neurological deterioration and report anything to the as an adverse event if you're concerned. And and we saw over the over 3,000 patients, very, very few um, incidences of this was reported. And this went to a, a committee that adjudicated them. They didn't know which arm the child was in. And they said that the vast majority that had been reported to them were unlikely to be associated with the fluid status. So we had very few children that developed pulmonary edema or heart failure, which again was very surprising to us. So we fast-tracked this rapidly into the, uh, uh, the New England Journal, um, and the following year we got the um, Paper of the Year Award. So we were very pleased with ourselves um, because we thought we'd done a, an important trial for African children because this will save lives for many lives going forward. But it wasn't always the response that we had hoped for, that there was, has been a, a quite a lot of controversy over the results, with some people saying that this is a really important trial, but other people um, saying that, um, or trying to explain away the, uh, the mortality in the trial for, for various different reasons. And so I think the, f the first thing that um, anybody would want us here is, is that how well did you conduct the trial? And we believe that there was no methodological blunder in terms of the actual running of the trial. That yes, that 100% of children followed their randomization arms, so the doctors were doing what they were meant to do. That in terms of recruitment, we only had two minor violations, which is for a, a, a 3,200 children is a, a very, very small number. All the, all the doctors and nurses had adhered to their randomization and retention for the primary endpoint, which is also a really important, um, is, is again, so we had done a very, very high quality trial, so that couldn't really explain the results. There's, there was, I'm going to just go through a few of these comments. Um, the first one was that children in the FEAST trial weren't that sick, so we gave a lot of children who shouldn't have ever received fluid in the first place. There were questions around the definition of shock, but also people saying, well, it's going to be explained away because the most of the deaths occurred in children who had anemia or um, malaria. Well, I can tell you from the baseline characteristics, these children were not shot, uh, were not um, uh, uh, sort of... Uh, uh, that these children were extremely unwell. We had over 50% having fairly severe acidosis, as you saw with Action Loy. We had, uh, yes, we had f um, over 50% did have malaria parasites, um, but uh, that means that 50% didn't. So again, the very large subgroup of uh, uh, children who, who were did weren't malarious, and, um, at, and with 12% tw uh, with pro positive blood cultures. This just shows you that we were able to measure very, very carefully how much they were received, and those who, who received the boluses, um, you saw, was completely different from the control arm. So there was separation in terms of the volume that we, they were given. So we were obviously following what their allocation was. I think the statistician for the trial, who's ex immensely experienced, who's done lots and lots of the first HIV trials, he said, from his experience as a statistician, he's never seen such remarkable consistency in every single subgroup that we had pre-specified and, and subsequently looked at, there has been no evidence that fluid boluses uh, are at any benefit. And th this includes large groups of, se of sepsis, um, acidosis, and, uh, and also um, uh, uh, children with malaria. Just looking at the definitions of uh, shock, we'd, shock definitions vary worldwide for pediatrics. A lot of it's just based on clinical signs rather than um, um, low blood pressure. Um, and we'd actually, the, the FEAST trial was very pragmatic in the sense that it captured all of these. And we were able to show for every single definition, a guideline definition of shock, that fluid boluses were harmful. But most particularly for the WHO one, 40% mortality on bolus versus 20% for control. We often get lots of questions, but what about the subgroup? Well, 
this is um, culture positive um, uh, blood, uh, organisms, and so 14% mortality in the bolus versus no bolus, which was 8%. You could say, well, actually, that's a small group. It's not statistically significant. But the most important thing is it's completely consistent with the overall result. Did your hemoglobin level, when you actually admitted, uh, make any difference? This is a, you won't be able to see the data here, but this takes a, a hemoglobin level at three, four, five, six, all the way down. That says boluses are better, that says controls better. And as you see the diamonds for all the way along here, it doesn't matter what your he, um, hemoglobin status was, fluid boluses were harmful. So we, in a subsequent review of uh, who was in the trial and also the response to boluses and, 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 and uh, the sort of terminal events, we went back and re-looked re at this because we simply couldn't have published all of this in the primary paper. And just wanted to remind you that this is what we were, we looked at shock reversal at one hour. And this is what the doctors were seeing. They were seeing that children who received boluses, they, 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 they we reversed shock more rapidly, they woke up, their conscious level was much, much better. But this did not translate into a, a shock reversal at one hour, did not translate to a survival benefit. Um, those who had no shock at one hour you had a, 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 still had a relative risk, a fairly high relative risk of dying. So we thought that that was a, a very important observation. What you see in front of your eyes doesn't necessarily translate to a, a meaningful clinical outcome. We'd, we'd got a whole set of uh, pre subsequent um, analysis in, in included in this paper, including children with dehydration, acidosis. It didn't really matter. This is another forest plot saying control is better than, uh, than bolus. So what was that terminal endpoint? So uh, cardiogenic shock, we, we looked at the endpoint team looked at this. They did not know which arm the children in. They were totally blind, so they had to say, what was the terminal mode of death for children? And they, they were thinking that the, 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 um, this group were the children who'd not received bolus, but in fact it was. They would they'd might have had shock reversal, but then they went back very rapidly into lethal shock. And it, the excess mortality in the FEAST trial was explained by children dying in, in lethal shock, and not a, a f uh, the fluid overload of, um, in, in, uh, in, um, indicated by neurological or respiratory events. So this was a, an enormous surprise to us because um, uh, that's really explaining the most of the excess mortality. We found that, obviously, that it's, it wasn't the children who were less sick. It was the children who were extremely sick um, that had the worst outcome. Um, the cardiovascular collapse was the, uh, the cause of excess death. Um, we, we suggested that the FEAST trial should prompt a, a, a review of, of guidelines worldwide around the rate and the volume of fluids uh, uh, um, uh, in pediatric shock, particularly for the, uh, the data where, for the places where we're practicing in, uh, in, uh, um, in resource poor settings. For the paediatricians, I just thought I just wanted to remind you where the guidelines, what the, what informed the guidelines, because in the um, early 90s or throughout the 90s, it used to be 40 mils per kilo. It was based on a study. It was not a trial. That it was basically a retrospective review, um, and it was it included 34 children. Um, um, and not the nine children who, were, um, who had received 40 mils per kilo had better outcomes downstream than those who'd received less volume. So that's when the guideline recommended 40 mils per kilo on nine children. There was a, a second study, exactly the same design, tertiary referral centre in Pittsburgh, um, incorporating uh, uh, 91 children. And it said that the 34 children in whom the community physicians had given 60, 60 mils per kilo over 15 minutes had a better, better outcomes than those who had received less volume. And if you ask anybody in an emergency room, are you able to give 50, 60 mils per kilo in 15 minutes? I don't think most people can. So, I mean, just look at this. This is the evidence that underpins the 60 mils per kilo in 15 minutes that's recommended worldwide. A very strong recommendation, obviously um, bit based on poor level of evidence. And if you think, well, I'm just focusing on one little guideline, this is a superb review for the, those who are interested in it by uh, um, Hilton and Belemo, saying actually what, what is, you know, where did fluid resuscitations, what is the um, international evidence for it? And it's worse than you, you actually think. Uh, even the um, animal-based studies have not been conducted. <laughs> 
And it reminds us, like anything that we do, using oxygen, using fluids in the emergency room, these are drugs. They have good effects, but they also can have harmful effects. So I had hoped for a, a guideline review, certainly for the hospital for care. This is what's this is what's influences practice in, in, in the hospitals where we are. But um, even although we had sent them lots of policy briefs and all the feast trial data, in 2013 the guidelines were written and they continue to recommend fluid boluses for resource poor settings. So we challenged this um, in, a, in a paper from the W saying that they, do they realise how many children um, they, they may be harming as a result of their continuing recommendations. And this could be in, in excess of 100,000 children in Africa alone each year as a result of them continuing to recommend fluid bonuses. And I think it brings you back to thinking, why, why do I do medicine and what, you know, what do we do? And I think the first thing one should remind oneself is first do no harm. We were fortunate to uh, be able to engage with MSF. MSF immediately after the feast trial data, uh, data um, uh, commissioned a systematic review which was published. They recommended MSF to no longer give fluid boluses for the groups of children who were in included in the feast trial and they revised their guidelines. So I think that we, we're, it's not all, all grim, so we were very for, um, glad that that happened. Today, we're going to go back to see... During that time, action two again other now, children died on the table next to her. So that action was the recipient of evidence-based care. If we'd given her a fluid bolus, she wouldn't have even survived that first day. That's why we do research. And if one wants to see anything more, that, that, that to YouTube is available. Uh, that, that film is available on the YouTube. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Timing okay? Thank you. This is, that was brilliant. Brilliant, of course. Let's see if we have any questions uh, through the app. Oh, we have one. Oh. <laughs> and the question I think you have had before. <laughs> uh, uh, and it asks you if it's possible to elaborate on the impact on your results of the FEAST trial on Western medicine. Should we be careful with, fu with fluids? In what, which cases and which not? What do you think? I think we tried to be very responsible when we actually published the FEAST trial result. We actually had a small little video that did feature Action Loy in it. Um, that was actually published at the same time as the paper and with a link to the, in, in the New England Journal. And we did say in that video, um, Di Gibb, who was uh, involved in the uh, analysis of the data, she said that, you know, whilst this uh, data will uh, should um, re-challenge guidelines for the settings in which it was done, obviously elsewhere needs to consider the results, but there may be differences between Africa and where, you, where you're practicing, and that research should be done um, before we, sh we start to think about changing our guidelines. We didn't want to leave people standing in emergency rooms across the world thinking, Ooh, should I give a fluid bolus? I think the relevant research should be done, and I think that is now beginning to be done. It's obviously taken a little bit of time, but there's certainly a few small studies, one in Canada um, that's called Squeeze that's being done in paediatrics, and there's another one called Fish that's been done in the UK. But I've just back from Australia where I hear that they're also in adults, they're doing, um, the, I think it's the refresh trial where they're giving much more conservative fluid um, uh, therapy to adults. And interestingly, this has been done in Western uh, Australia, and the clinicians are not wanting to use aggressive fluid resuscitation. They'd much prefer to be giving the, con the conservative. So I think it has ta taken a little time for attitudes mm. to change and, and, and concerns. I mean, I think that it's not just feast. There are accumulating in, um, data saying the amount of fluid that has been given has downstream effects on the length of stay, renal replacement therapy, uh, and, and, and harm from because they're all sodium rich and chloride rich. And so there is quite a lot of data that are accumulating to say this is a drug and we need to respect it. That's, uh, that's interesting. What you say that, you mean that uh, perhaps 
Your results means that uh, what we all say is common knowledge. <laughs> it's go going to, it's, it's crackulating a bit mm -hmm. so that we might, it might be ethical possible to do that studies, which were perhaps not possible before your study, because we all know that we have to load oceans into our patients. Yes, I think so. I think it, it provides that. I mean, and certainly, I mean, you're going to hear in the next part of the conference the dis uh, about goal-directed therapy. My question to people, now you've done the goal-directed therapy, shows yeah. that not work. Are we going to de-escalate what we're doing in the emergency room? Because I think the, the important thing is, is what happens early on, and if we can stop the, the rate and the volume that we're giving, you know, that actually might reduce some of the downstream effects of that. So we are actually doing feast in sheep. Um, this is in Australia. Um, there's a, well, I've got a research fellow who's going out there, so he's lo has, has looking at all aspects of myocardial function, um, to, uh, using many, many different markers. And they're also showing that actually uh, the feast, the sheep that are receiving fluid boluses compared to the control, their troponins within eight hours soar high. So actually showing that there probably is evidence of, and, and it's also reflected in the myocardial of, uh, uh, observations that it actually is uh, harmful to the to the myocardium, but also to the macro microvascular circulation. So I think that there will be emerging, uh, which will provide a lot more rationale for equipoise. Mm. In this respect, I have got a question from the audience here. Um, what is your view? Uh, the, your patients received boluses. Mm. Uh, could it be the, the bolus way of administration that was harmful? Yes, I mean, so we gave our boluses over 20 mils per kilo. We had a long, long discussion because the group included some people with pediatric intensive care experience, and they, they felt that that was almost homeopathic. Um, so, um, so we were actually more, much more conservative. We, did, we will have further analysis bit to be able to look at whether the... Uh, uh, the actual re um, the volume that we were giving, um, so because um, comparing the 20 mils per kilo to 40 mils per kilo, because there was a suggestion that actually there was a volume, uh, there was a, a dose response as well in terms of mortality. So I think it's, I think it's not just speed, but it's also the amount. I guess your 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 response will be we have to do research, <laughs> but uh, how would this <laughs> apply to you to to adults? Your results. What do you think? Um, so I think uh, uh, adult physicians and, and intensivists have said, well, this is not really relevant because you didn't really have very large groups of children with low blood pressure. We did have another group of children. It was called, I've just presented feast stratum A. There was feast stratum B who had low blood pressure, and they went into a, a trial that compared albumin versus saline. And there was only 39 children enrolled into that trial, and it wasn't because we were excluding them. It's just, they just weren't there. It's a very, very late complication in pediatric shock, and, and the, it was associated with a very high mortality in both of those bolus groups. But I think... Uh, in terms of, you know, there, there is some continuity, or there should be, that I think you recognise that uh, 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 hypertension is a fairly common consequence. But I think, there, I think that there are conversations going on around the world that people are b wondering about de-escalating what they're giving in the uh, emergency room. I can only recommend <laughs> what I say, because I'm not an adult physician, but I think it's, there's, there is some generalizability there. We completely understand that. I think we should have lunch now. Uh, <laughs> Catherine Maitland, thank you very much.